Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Minister Khalif Muab El. I'm out of Madison, Wisconsin. We represent Expo, Ex-Prisoners Organizing. Expo in the building. Yes, sir. Well, I imagine I'm about to make a whole bunch of people upset, but we got to know what the truth is, right? This is a study uh, PowerPoint put together by one of my comrades in Madison, Wisconsin, Reverend Everett Mitchell. And we always wonder why the police get away when we got video footage of them gunning us down and murdering us in the streets and no weapons on us and then they lie and they put the narrative out there that we're the criminals. You done victimized us and now you villainizing, villainizing us for being criminals, making us into criminals when we're the victims. And so today we're gonna try to provide a little context for that. Next slide. All of these are cameras, video footage of officers being engaged to the next one. We see this all the time. This is, this is no, this is no uh, secret. National conversations about Chicago, this happens. Eight hundred and eighty six people were gunned down by police in 2015. And this is a narrative that continues to persist even today. A lot of people argue that the body cameras isn't enough. And today we're going to find out why that why that's true. Here's a Supreme Court case. In this case, there was a young 17-year-old young brother who was alleged to be burglarizing a house. And the police saw him and said, freeze. Instead of freezing, he took off, boom. Police shot him in the head, murdered him. Now, go to the next slide. The laws in Tennessee justified that murder because it provides clearly that the statute, if the notice of intent to arrest the defendant is there and he flees, the police can use whatever force necessary to subdue and to get an arrest. That's what Tennessee said. So when this young brother took it to court, you know what happened. No charges were filed. No nothing. The laws of Tennessee justified the excessive force. To the next. In that decision, Garner appealed it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that the force, that the Tennessee laws were in fact unconstitutional. And that there should have been de-escalation stratagems applied to the situation. And that because Garner didn't present any kind of threat. The officer didn't have any reason to kill or gun him down, especially because he was a slender 17-year-old guy who didn't pose any threat to police. Obviously, his safety wasn't in question, right? Go to the next slide. Now, there was a dissent in that case that was overlooked by the other justices, the Rehnquist. Rehnquist said that the court silent on critical issues or factors in the decision of deadly force invites the second guessing of the police. So he didn't like the fact that the court ruled in guessing, second guessing the police because technically the officer knows what's going on on the scene and the officer has the legal standing and right to say what is and what's not. And so second guessing that is like an insult to the officer and so Rehnquist didn't go with that decision. But here's where it gets tricky. Go to the next one. Now here's a case in Graham that had nothing to do with murder, homicide, or anything like that. But Rehnquist, he inserted his decision of dissent into this case about a young guy who was a diabetic, who had went into a diabetic shock, and subsequent to that, he fainted, fell out. They slammed him on the floor, ran his head into the police car, and he passed out. 
Go to the next slide. Now, Rehnquist's decision shows back up in 1989. And Rehnquist becomes the controlling law of the land today, where it says, go to the next slide. I see this. All claims that law enforcement officials have used successive force, deadly or not, in the course of an arrest, investigatory, stop, or other seizure of a free citizen are to be analyzed under the objective reasonable standard, rather than substantial standard of due process standard. Now, reasonable to standard inquiry is whether the officer's actions are objectively reasonable in the light of the facts and circumstances confronting them with regard to their underlying intent or motivation particularly forced to be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than the 2020 vision of hindsight. So video cameras don't mean nothing. Their perception is everything. And this is a Supreme Court ruling and that's the controlling law of today of the land. So just because you got a video camera out and you capturing this stuff on footage, it doesn't matter in the context of the law. And these officers know that and they design their policies around that. That's the problem. And you know how hard it is to get a Supreme Court to overrule itself? How many people you know gonna go the extra mile, go beyond the negotiations, forget about the million dollar settlement degrees and decrees and all of that stuff and say, okay, I'm taking this all away to get this case overturned. This is the controlling law. This is one of the reasons why they can gun us down in the street. And you wonder why the first thing they say is, oh, he was a gang member. He had a gun. Oh, he had a felony background. He's a formerly incarcerated person. Or oh, he was a bad one, right? Because it creates the instance in the public eye in light of this particular case that the officer in his mind felt like he was threatened. And so naturally that justifies whatever action he wants to take in the wake of any situation. Whether we see it as excessive force and whether we see it as an injustice, this is a man that's unarmed, no threat, boom, he gets gunned down by the police. The police, all he has to say is that he felt threatened. So the media saturates itself, saturates the nation with all of the bad things that they can pull up out of this man's background and this is why they get away with it. The Rehnquist dissent, Graham versus O'Connor. This law changed in 1985 and became the law of the land in 1989. That's the battle. Peace. Uh, thank you, brother. So, um, deserving or undeserving? Okay, inside those cages, and, and, and I guess some of folks here have seen those cages, that there are people who are seen as deserving and undeserving. We talked about it today. Violent versus nonviolent. So I'd like to have um, um, Kathy Bodine, by the way, Another one of my comrades. If you want to know what the weather underground looked like, did you see the movie? <laughs> this is what the weather underground looks like. Hey, great to be here with everybody. So this is amazing to be here, and uh, it's amazing to meet people from all around the country that are doing this work. I mean, it's really, really, really exciting. So. Just like, thank you to everybody, that's it. Let's give yourselves. So, I work with a place called the Center for Justice at Columbia University. I work with RAP, Release Aging People from Prison. I'm here with two of my uh, sisters and brothers, Laura Whitehorn and Mujahid Farid, and also National Council of Women. So, I feel like the thing that I most want to talk about is the question of this divide between people in prison with violent crimes and people in prison with nonviolent crimes. I myself was incarcerated for 22 years on a violent crime. And so many of the people that I was close to in prison did my time with me, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Many of the guys that I've met since I've come home working in New York City uh, have done a lot of time. And 
So it's something that I think a lot about. And let's start with the fact that about a month ago in New York City, I mean in New York State, a man named John McKenzie, who had been given 25 years to life, went to parole board 10 times, and at the age of 40, was turned down again in spite of a contempt judgment from a judge that said the parole board had to let him out, that there was no basis for keeping this man in. He was 70 years old, he did 40 years on a 25 year bid, and he hung himself. And before he hung himself, he sent letters out to people that they would receive after he died, explaining what it meant to have the parole board deny you parole over and over and over again, and how it destroyed the soul. At the same time, about a year, two years ago, President Obama spoke at the NAACP convention, and it was that convention, which I think somebody referred to earlier, he did say, we incarcerate too many people. We have to let the people with nonviolent crimes out of prison. But the murderers, the drug kingpins, the gang people, yes, we believe in redemption, but they need to be in prison. That's a policy that comes from high up and it's implemented all the way down. It's implemented in sentencing reform, it's implemented in parole decisions, it's implemented in clemency, pardons, work release, it's implemented when compassionate release, and when people come home, it continues to, di to discriminate them against them. So the question that I wanna talk about is, what do we do about that divide? Now we've talked today about the fact that sometimes you need to compromise. All right, bills get passed, you're willing to have a bill passed, it's gonna exclude people with violent offenses. But what's the impact of that? The impact of that is the creation of a group of good people in prison and bad people in prison. And as long as we continue accepting that divide, it means that we're gonna continue reinforcing it. Now, the fact is that after President Obama made that speech, he was challenged in numerous newspapers to say you can't decarcerate. You can't decarcerate and just keep people with violent crimes in prison. They represent 56% of the people in state prisons. If we continue to just let the nonviolent people convicted of drug offenses out and don't let people with violent offenses out, we're not gonna change the system. So that's one thing, it doesn't work. Secondly, the whole definition of violent and nonviolent changes. Prosecutors overcharge, there's things called felony, felony murder versus non-felony murder. There's different definitions of violent from different states, so even accepting that term can dig us into a hole that doesn't really work. But I think there's a third problem, which is in accepting that definition, we are essentially dehumanizing a very large group of people. And who are those people? Many of you are here. Long-termers in prison, I think we all know, are people that play a critical role in role models, in mentoring, and in, in essentially wardens around the country recognize that they basically help manage the prison because they offer a way to give some meaning into life. When you've spent 20, 25, and 30 years in prison, you've had to figure out how am I gonna live my life with meaning? And usually it's about serving people. It's about serving the community and figuring out a way to give back. In addition, the long-termers who come home have the lowest recidivism rate. Those convicted of murder have the lowest recidivism rate of any other group of people coming home from prison. And when people come home, long-termers are frequently people who make a major contribution. So many people in prison who didn't long do long time, many of whom were here, and many of whom I work with in New York, didn't happen to be long-termers, and they're making an enormous contribution, but the long-termers play a particular role in making that contribution. So the notion of keeping them in is almost a paradox. Why keep them in when they're the people who are least likely to come back, who are the people that have figured out a way to give meaning and in a sense represent transformative justice? Well, partly why they're kept in is people are afraid. But that fear that people have of long-termers goes against the facts that I've just given you and is completely intertwined with the racism in this country, the racial history, and the role that the media, the universities played in terms of reinforcing the notion of being afraid of black boys, the super predators, right? So if we can't deal with that racism, we're never gonna untangle this divide. And I think that the second thing is you know, when people are murdered, harm is done. People suffer. And how do we, as a movement that knows that the punishment paradigm, the punishment, the eternal punishment that our system has adopted, 
isn't the solution to the pain of people suffer when somebody dies. We have to come up with some other alternative. The victims' rights movement has said the only solution that we should have to the suffering that people feel when somebody's killed is to keep people, is the death penalty or keep people in prison for life without parole, which is a growing category. One out of nine people in our country now in prison is doing is, is, is life without parole. One out, of, is one out of nine. I mean, this is a long, long way of punishing people. But what do we come up with as an approach to dealing with the suffering? And I, I throw it out as a question more than something that we can take, I, that I want to try to answer. But I think that, you know, restorative justice approaches, us, us acknowledging as a movement, yes, we have to deal with that harm. And some of it, of course, is about understanding social responsibility, the role of society, that society has played in creating the conditions in which violence occurs. The violence of the society leads to violence in communities. But the other is, how do we, how do we deal with individual responsibility when someone has created harm? So we need to come up with that and not leave that answer to the victims' rights movement, whose only answer is, and to, the, and to the correctional system, and to the police, and to the state, the only answer is more punishment. In a sense, it's also about understanding that people in prison have also been victims. So the dichotomy between perpetrator and person in, and, and victim doesn't work, and we have to overcome that as well. So I'm throwing out all of these ideas, but I think the, the fundamental thing that I want to leave us with is to say, yes, there may be times when compromise is needed. Maybe in the Prop 47 it was needed, or Prop 57 it's needed. And yet that compromise leads to a dehumanization of a huge number of people, many of whom are sitting in this room. And how do we avoid that de playing into that dehumanization that happens if these compromises are being made? Let's not accept the divide between the violent and the nonviolent. Let's understand it's all of us or none. It's all of us or none. It's all of us or none. Uh, that's my comrade right there. Uh, in the 60s, we fought for social justice. And they didn't all just look like us. Everybody wasn't a panther. That's another one of the comrades. And I just get tired of people not recognizing that. Um, so I want you to, to take a moment right now and use your mind for something. And I want to say a word, immigrant. And I want you to see in your mind who that is. If America has done its job well, you saw a Latino or a Latino. A Latina or a Latino? That's what you just saw in your mind right now. So the deserving and the undeserving is perpetrated down that line as well. And so I want to have a Latina come up here and talk about how that looks like so that we begin to be able to shape the message in our response to the madness. Uh, so I have uh, Sister uh, Erica. Ovila, and, and I don't know how, how Ovaya, I, I'm bad at it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what's up, how everybody, how's everybody doing? All right, so my name is Erica, and I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, all right, where AZ at, where AZ at? Um, my dad is undocumented, and my brother is in prison. And so I've been doing migrant rights justice for the past um, almost nine years. And it was very easy for me to gravitate into this movement because it was very familiar to me. We had a federal agreement back in 2007 called 287G, which allowed our sheriffs to perform raids on the streets. And so during this time, he was blocking off uh, neighborhoods of color, primarily where Latinos were, and uh, conducting raids. And he would announce it to the community three days before so that people would live in fear for the next three days and hide and find refuge, refuge in, in homes together. And so we started protesting that. And, and years later, we, we got another uh, law called SB 1070. 
And SB 1070 basically legalized racial profiling. And from then, it's been nothing but uh, incarceration. Everywhere I look is incarceration on my family, you know, in my community. And uh, the prisons, the, the private prisons are um, expanding. And so recently, the Department of Justice stated that, that it would no longer house federal inmates in a, in a private detention center. Well, most of our, de I mean, in a private uh, detention, I mean, a private prison, well, the immigrant detention is primarily made up of um, private prisons. In Arizona, we have Eloy, which is one of the worst detention centers ever, where people are constantly held in solitary confinement and will do anything to get out of that situation, including uh, kill themselves, so try to commit suicide. And so, um, I don't know, I came to this conference and I was like, um, well, me being, you know, having my brother in prison and now I volunteer inside a women's prison, uh, I came here wondering, you know, how, how we can all work together because um, the issues are the same. The handcuffs are the same. The jail cells are the same. The beds are the same. The police coming into our community, it's the same. We have, a, our community is scared to call the police. They don't wanna call the police anymore because the police are questioning the caller and asking them for IDs now. You know what I mean? And um, I'm asking myself, like, what, what could we do? You know, I, I hear the slogan over and over, all of us or none of us, and I'm not seeing any representation of the expanding migrant detention. It is mass incarceration, it's included. I mean, uh, we have border patrol. We don't, we don't only have cops. You know, my brother was shot by Phoenix PD who shoots everybody. I mean, before I left uh, Arizona in two, 12 hours, they shot two people. So my brother, he is in a prison until 2021 and he was shot with a hollow point gun and so he has bullets spread all over his body. So I, I'm here and I'm hearing these messages about you know, people being shot. Yes, we have a police issue. We have a border patrol issue. We have a militarization issue in Arizona. I mean, we're, we're being attacked on all sides. So uh, some of the ways that we combat that, I'm with an organization called Puente Movement, and um, we have a legal clinic. All right, give it up, give it up. Uh, we have a legal clinic there that uh, we started. That's my friend, Giovanna. She's the legal director. And we've gotten out 200 and 224 people out of immigrant detention and reunited. 224 people. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Has anybody heard about that man? Okay. That man has criminal charges put against him right now. It took years of protesting that man, but he's 24 years in power. He has tent city in Arizona, in uh, Phoenix. Uh, he calls that a concentration camp. You know, he brags about it to his friends. This is a concentration camp. He brags that he is uh, looked at like the KKK. That's what type of environment we're living under. We're, we're Arizona, the state of hate. You know, it's constant oppression there. So again, I'm here because I wanna know cross country, how can we work together? How can we come in and, and fulfill this voice? How can we talk about felonies? Because anybody who's caught in a workplace raid is given a felony. You know, we gotta fight, we gotta fight for our families. You know, we, we start community, you know, committees everywhere. We're attending courts with people. I mean, I don't know if you guys, have you heard of Operation Streamline? All right, Operation Streamline, if anybody's caught at the border, they get 100 people and put them in a courtroom with no translation, and they all just go across the board, guilty, 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 and boom, right into a detention center. People who speak indigenous languages from South America who have no clue what the criminal justice system is about. You know, we already feel like they don't speak our language. I know I don't. Like, when they put my brother up, the legal jargon was out of my hands. I was like, what are we talking about here? But for someone who speaks an indigenous language in Spanish, that's even worse. And then no translation. And then in Arizona, they segregate people. If you don't have papers and papers. You know what I'm saying? 
So us as a community, as people who are fighting back, who are formerly incarcerated, who knows what that dehumanization is like, we gotta reach out to our, our marginalized brothers and sisters who truly are second class, class citizenship. Uh, they, there are 11 million undocumented people in this country, and we have presidents who are talking about how they're gonna round them up. So, do um, you wanna say something? Hello, my name is Giovanna. I also want to add that um, we have the biggest deportation machine on U.S. soil for the longest time. So that's another thing that we're trying to combat. On top of the 1996 immigration reform law that we're also trying to, and all the criminalization laws that they've had in 1994, you know, the war on drugs and et cetera. But also when you're dealing with detention, um, you have something that's called CIMT, crime involving moral turpitude, which is mandatory detention. So no matter, there's no other way, you pay your criminal, and then you go to Eloy and you sit there until they find a solution, if they find a solution, to your case. So we have our member, which is our members, which is a 350 member base that all have um, criminal convictions that have been in Eloy, have, that have been in solitary confinement and all these cells. And they're like, um, I sent them the pictures of the mobile unit outside and they're just in tears. They're like, it hurts. I'm like, yeah, because it's all the same. We have to bring our loved ones back home. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, we need all these voices. It is all of us that are. And, and, and so I want to keep these sisters coming at you because it's really important that we hear all these voices. And so Felicia. Uh, it's been doing work in San Francisco uh, around a, uh, a case that's real sensitive to us here um, because the uh, uh, liberal San Francisco police shoot people down like dogs too. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, now let me hear you because my name is Felicia Jones and I fight for justice every day of my life. It's not that I fight for justice because now it's a romantic type of thing. I've been fighting for justice all my life because I am a black woman. I come from a black community. I have black brothers. I have black nephews, cousins, community members. And it is very important that we stand together and fight this fight for justice. Justice that means a lot of things to us and right now I just want to take a minute to say I am so proud of Dorsey Nunn. Let's give it up for Dorsey. <laughs> He's been fighting this fight for a long time. I'm also formerly incarcerated. I've been into every state penitentiary in the state of California with the exception of two. My W number is W31530. It's something that I never want to forget. I was released April 5th, 1991, and I haven't looked back since then. And so here I am. I stand here with you. I stand here fighting with you. But right now, the fight that I fight in San Francisco is police brutality. Brutality. I am a leader with the Justice for Mario Woods Coalition in San Francisco who was a brother who was shot at over 40 times. 21 of those bullets pierced his body. 20 of them in the back, one in the head. So when we think of San Francisco, we, we think of San Francisco, the beautiful city by the bay. But is it just as racist and corrupt as any other city in this nation. And so we fight not only for Justice for Mario Woods, we fight for uh, Jessica Nelson Williams who stole a car and was um, trying to get away from the police and the police shot one time, killed her. We fight for Milcar Perez Lopez out of the Mission District in which they shot him down. We fight for Alex Nieto who was shot over 59 times, shot at I should say, 59 times with 15 of those bullets piercing his body. We stand with love and blood 
campaign. Uncle Bobby right here, comrade. My sister right here, my comrade. And so we fight. But it's really difficult when we talk about unity. Is that a lot of us, we are not, we are not equipped for the long haul. And we must begin to equip ourselves for the long haul. And with our coalition, we call that coalition discipline under the leadership of Christopher Muhammad of the Nation of Islam, our fearless leader. And so we've been fighting for 10 months. We had three demands when we first got together in December after Mario's brutal execution. And our three demands was one, that Chief Sir either be fired or he must resign. Our second demand is that all of the officers be brought up on charges of murder. Our third demand is that there must be an independent patterns and practice investigation of San Francisco Police Department because San Francisco Police Department is a department of cops that have gone rogue. And so we the people of San Francisco, when we first started, Chief Sir was like, I'm not going anywhere. He had, he had over a $400,000 job to lose. He, oh, I ain't going nowhere. Oh yeah, we gon you gonna go somewhere. You going, we gonna make sure the pressure is there. And you know what? He resigned under pressure of we the people. I don't know how many uh, cities across the nation uh, Uncle Bobby has done that. I think we are one of the few, right? We are one of the few who made a chief of police resign. And that's we the people. The power of the people. And we can do this because it has to stop. Black and brown brutality from police must stop. It's an issue all across this nation. And so when we begin to think about incarceration, all of that goes with it. Because when they look at our black and brown brothers, the first thing they wanna do is run. Run your background, see if you have a record, see if you on probation, see if you on parole, see if you're a felon. And we all know who are sitting here, I'm an ex-felon. We all know that they try to stop you. But we must begin to have courage deep within, and I know everybody here has that, because if you didn't, you wouldn't be sitting in these seats that you're in. And so we must come together across states, exchange emails, exchange business cards, not just because it's a thing to do, oh, can I have your business card? Use it. How many business cards do you have from various conferences that you have never used? Come on, people. We got to stop that. We got to begin to network. We got to make, begin to make things happen. And in San Francisco and Oakland, we are making things happen. We are, there were nine officers, thank you. There were nine officers who surrounded Mario Woods. Five of them shot over 40 times at our son, at our brother. What happened to the other four? Why didn't they shoot? Okay, so why didn't they shoot? And so these are some of the concerns that we are concerned about, and we say justice delayed is justice denied, and we will not have justice denied on these cop killers, these murderers across our nation, these rogue cops who continue to want to kill black and brown brothers and sisters that we love. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 okay, so this panel we really need to come out of here unified around how we view this stuff. What is our analysis? Because it don't help us if a camera catches us here and we have one thing we're saying about what they're doing to us and we take 10 cameras and we got 10 answers. That's problematic for our unity. So 
Uncle Bobby, who's the um, uncle of uh, Oscar Grant, one of the most egregious cases um, here in the Bay Area, uh, will say you know, some words to us around the search uh, for the undeserved. Salam alaikum, everyone. First, I'd like to ask that we take a moment of silence for a comrade of ours named Darren Seals or King D. D in Ferguson, who was just recently shot in the head and burned to death. He's the sixth young man since Michael Brown's murder to have died that way, and he's been very outspoken concerning police terrorism in this country. So if we please can just take a moment of silence for him. Thank you. I am very troubled. Uh, let me first say, I am affectionately known to the community as Uncle Bobby. I am the uncle of Oscar Grant. For those that may not know, he was the young man killed on January 1st at the Fruitvale Bark Station right here in Oakland, California. And of course, uh, I had to ask myself this question as um, Dorsey shared with me the name of this panel called The Hunt for the Undeserving. In reality, the hunt for the undeserving is of those that don't fit in the category of the 1%. Thank you. But I think also more importantly, us who has been classified as a criminal in this society, as Michelle Alexander has shared with us, are much more apt to reap the brunt of this sick, handy system. We are at a state of emergency. And if you don't hear what I'm saying, you will definitely see later. This country is hemorrhaging on the fact that black life and brown life and marginalized li white life matters. The failure of police accountability across this country has created what we see a movement that has taken off. And if we fail as a people, as a community, as those that have actually re received the blunt of this country, we all, especially our babies and our children, will not have no form of the freedom and, and justice that this country alleges to grant to all of us. So this is really about our babies. It is time for us to take a serious stand. So uh, before I begin to get into what I understand about this hunt for the undeserving, I want to give a backdrop. And maybe someone has already shared it. But you know, the United States is only 5% of this world's population, but yet has the biggest prison institution in the world, 25%. That's right. We got to take a real look at that. We also know that it's 2.4 million men locked up in this country. That's right. And we know definitely that the greatest percent of them, especially, is black men. We are clear also that women are growing at 8% faster now in the incarceration system than it is with black men. We have been targeted and attacked. When emancipation took place, we thought in some form of way that we had arrived to a degree that we had some form of non-enslavement. But black codes took in the came into existence. And it took the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to unravel that. But again, another backlash, Jim Crow, came into existence. And then a young man named Emmett Till was killed, as Martin Luther King and others were speaking about our civil rights. And the movement took off because the community got involved because they was concerned not only with what Martin Luther King was saying, but what happened to Emmett Till and how May May shared with the world this brutal murder of her son. How many of you heard of Emmett Till? 
All of us as elders, so I know all of us should have heard of him. And if you haven't heard of Emmett Till and what happened in that respect, I suggest that you begin to read so that you can get clear on what's happening today. Michelle Alexander made it clear to us too that it is more men, black men, in, in, incarcerated than in the last days of slavery. She also made it clear to us that there's an undercast system that really pertains to all of us that are sitting in this room today. I'm trying to highlight this history so that you can see that even though we have made some gains, there's always been a backlash. So in 1964, we gained the Civil Rights Amendment and that came off the backs of us really fighting hard for Emmett Till, listening to Martin Luther King, and the system giving us something that we thought gave us some form of rights again. But yet again, Reagan war on poverty, Nixon war on drugs, Clinton war on crime, and of course Obama and Bush war on terrorism, there has been a war launched on us. And from that war, as you can see, many has been incarcerated and killed. But what brings me here today is my nephew, Oscar Grant, was shot and murdered. And the very first thing that came out the system mouth was that he had a criminal history. And as we take a look around this country and look at all the young men that are being killed, the very first thing that come out the system mouth is that they had a criminal history. To justify, that's right, I heard someone say, to justify the murder of our babies, the murder of our children, the murder of our uncles and our aunts and our fathers, our brothers, our sisters. For Oscar, the community was outraged. So I stand here to let you know that what happened with Oscar can again happen in the essence of, and I'm not talking about in a negative way him being murdered, but in the essence of this. The community embraced us as a family. They stood with, with, with us as a family. They cried with us as a family. They went back and forth to court with us as a family. But most importantly, they stood and they spoke about what happened to Oscar utilizing the First Amendment right. And because of that momentum, because labor got involved, because of those that were morally adjusted in this world to, that, that had what we consider some political esteem, um, also began to speak on the issue concerning Oscar Grant. And we, for the first time in California state history, was able to get an officer arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. We don't count that as a victory, but we do count it as historical. Because right now, babies are still dying all across the United States. So I say all that to say this. There's a lot of people here today. An injury to one is an injury to all. That's right. All of us are none is so critical because in the movement of Oscar Grant, that was exemplified when District Attorney Head Tom Arloff, the one that prosecuted Huey Newton, said to us that he would not speak to the community, but he would speak to one of us. And that one of us said, "If you, you cannot just speak to me, you gotta speak to all of us. He said, well, my office is not big enough to hold all of you. He said, well, you're gonna have to speak to us outside. He said, well, listen, can I speak to seven of you instead of all of you? And the statement was, you must speak to all of us or none of us. And he spoke to all of us. And by him speaking to all of us, that showed the power of unity the power of unity, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, unity is more powerful than an atomic bomb. 
Though they are trying to destroy us, if we stand together as one unit, I'm telling you, we will turn this system around. We can no longer allow this system to divide us. Okay. We can no longer allow this system to continuously divide us by our ethnicity, by the color of our skin, or even who is considered a criminal or not. A quick history, and then I'm done. On January 1st, Oscar Grant, Adolph Grimes, and Robbie Tolan were all shot in the back by the police. Adolph Grimes died, Oscar died, Robbie Tolan lived. Of course, 19 days later, Obama was inaugurated. And he didn't even ask the question what happened to these young men or other young men prior to his inauguration on January 19th. But two weeks later, he brought in Eric Holder, the top cop of the nation. And yet, we again thought we had arrived. And then three months later, Henry Louis Gates, a Harvard professor, was going into his house and he was arrested. And he spoke about that. He spoke about that, showed the real classism that exists within this country when it comes to somebody black being in a, a favorable place versus somebody that has had some uh, engagement with the law. That's right. That's the thing. Right. And what I'm saying is when that happened, the escalation of black life being murdered across this country took off. Not just black life, but brown life took off. Not just brown life, but marginalized white life took off. And so we started seeing many die in this country over and over and over. You know, and that brings me just to this conclusion that in order for us to change the dynamics of what's happening in this country, we must all stand together. It is about all of us or none. And that's the way we're gonna change this country. Thank you. Um, we're going to try to kind of move this along so maybe we can get some questions in. So there's some gloom as we think about what's happening to our children. But there's some light and some things that light up my heart as an old man. And that's some young folks who are doing work in this country that probably people in this room don't even know about. They got something to say about this issue. And let me bring my brother, let me get this right, PFK Boom up here and let him talk to you from Baltimore. How we all doing today? We all we got, we all we need. I'm here today, not for myself at all, I'm not even here. Don't even look at me, I'm here to speak for people from Baltimore all the way down here to Oakland. Because the situation don't change. But what I'm here to tell you is how to get it done. Band and Box got done in Maryland, we did it. Felons got their voting rights, we did it. The way we did it is the way they just said right here. You're not gonna get it done if all the skin ain't in the game, which is everybody. It's not a white issue, not a black issue, it's a human issue. But what I like to say is, sometimes you gotta get a little dirty. Everybody's not made to be dirty. In Baltimore, we got our opposition. Our opposition, of course, is anybody that's a sea holder. Anybody to get a public check in our city has to be accountable for that public check. In my nation, we will make you accountable. We will make you accountable. Everybody in here pay taxes. So the same people that's killing us is the same people we paying to kill us. Think about that. We paid for some of these people to get off. In my city, they kill you, and you automatically get uh, immunity as a police officer. But guess what? Some of the police in my city are more black. All black ain't black in my city. All white ain't white, all Asian ain't Asian, and things like that, again. Fear lasts longer than love outside of this room. I got a unit called 300 Gangsters. We make them accountable in our city. Many may have known me from when I stuck that boy Jamal Bryan up. He, he's not a pastor in our city. Once you come outside the pastor room, you're just a regular person. I repeat that. Once you're a police, you come outside your badge, 
You're a regular person in my neighborhood. I got 300 gangsters for him. I repeat that, I got 300 gangsters for him. That's when things have to get thick, thick in my city and we, have, and we get answers from that. I said, as I said, some things have to get thick. This is not about me. I've been home 20 years, placed on America's Most Wanted, had family members get on the stand against me and everything for money. It's a money issue. It is root to evil. Yeah, my uncle got wired on me in prison and everything. But there's a God. When you get out this fight right here, I'm going to say, and I'm going to say it again, if you got friends you, that's outside this fight, they're not your friends. I've been home 20 years and every day I wake up, I'm sad because I left men behind. I talk in prison and I got to leave them behind. A lot of things we find in ourselves able to do, we're able to engage the people, educate the people, but no, we are not able to empower the people right now because we're not coming together enough. You need money. But guess what, you need love. You gotta love yourself first before you can love me. So in this fight, sometimes we lose ourselves. When you gotta find yourself every day as you look in that mirror, you're not gonna be the same person every day when you gotta go back out there to do some of the things that each one of us has to do. We all got this thing called a lane. When the uprisings happened on April 15th, 2015, Freddie Gray, we all know that. It was black officers that killed Freddie Gray. White officers. And it's this thing called a system. We keep on forgetting that systems are ran by people. And people got an address. Take it to their house. Yeah, you've been locked up before. Get locked up again. Go to his house. That's public property on this sidewalk. Let his daughter know he killed your man. We got a governor. We had the dude that left out of uh, California named Bats. A lot of y'all know him. We ran him out of Baltimore. I personally ran him out of Baltimore. He know me, go ask him. I went to his house. I went to his church. I went where he eat at. He's not going to eat wrestling if my people ain't eating, because they did. That's right. Yeah, you got to raise the ante up a little bit. It's not for everybody. I ask you not to try this at home if you're not built like that. In my city. In my city, we got a saying called, go hard or go home. Some people may know this woman named Tawanda Jones whose brother Tyrone West got killed by 15 police officers. They was black and white, they got immunity before Tyrone hit the ground. But guess what, they ain't gonna win. We observed Tyrone's body last week and we gonna get our answers. So you might have to do that. So yeah, you gotta dig up bodies and all that. It gets ugly. But again, go hard or go home. It's not a white issue, not a black issue, not a Christian issue. Believe me, when he get out that car, he ain't asking you if you're a Muslim or Christian. He say, put your hands up. Unfortunately, 300 gangsters don't put their hands up. Salute. What I say to y'all again, as we go home, as you leave this, there's people in here watching that ain't with us. Hello, informant. Hello, FBI. My name Davon Antonio, never done PFK, boom. <laughs> Go tell that to the alphabet boys. I love each and every one of y'all that's in here because y'all took the opportunity to do what y'all needed to do and that's called put skin in the game and I'll go to war with y'all. We could beat Satan up and come back up here and get this done. Can't nobody beat us with unity, man. That's right, that's come on, right. man. And I saw that again with the band of box that we got in Maryland. We did that. We stepped to home. We went to their houses, did all that. And of course, it was many blacks who opposed band of box for us when we got there. And it was many my white brothers and sisters that was there to fight with me. Because we all got the same ID number. 253001 was mine. I've been home 20 years and as the lady was stating, I still remember mine. I ain't going to never forget that. Because if I forget that, I forget y'all. I ain't gonna take up much of y'all time because y'all know what time it is, but again, 300 gangsters is for the whole movement. But again, why do 300 gangsters have to step up that if the people step up, they might, we might not have to hurt them? I love y'all. I'm not gonna take up much of your time, but what I will say, when we get home, let's tie our boots up a little bit more tighter. If you wasn't maybe a more aware about uh, political awareness or what you need to do and what we do in Baltimore, see who, owns, who loans you owns you. I don't want you give me nothing. 
So what I'm saying to you is we don't ask for no seat holders. We put people in the seat. I don't vote because I put people in the seat. Literally. Russell never done. That's my cousin. He ran for state's attorney. So we wouldn't have had the Mosby issue if the people would have listened. Salute. So we've covered quite a few dichotomies. And what I'd like to have happen now is to bring um, somebody who's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps, but somebody who will tell you the truth. And young man, my leader, Manuel LaFontaine. Thank you. So as Comrade Thug said, it's gonna get a little bit uncomfortable, right? Because we shouldn't be so comfortable. I mean, it's great that we've created a safe and brave forum. How many here would agree? That's all? How many here have felt that this, com this, this conference has made people feel a little bit safe and secure and brave? Now, if you look at the schedule, right, the program said certain people. There are certain people that spoke here on this panel that were not included in the, in the program, right? And that's because when you look at all of us and none, it's a movement that's always growing. Now, you can put stuff on paper, but we're always evolving, right? We don't change. We evolve, right? So when people say, you change, no, I'm the same core person I've always been. Except I'm evolving how I think and how I behave, right? And several things I wanted to raise, right, that one of the biggest problems here in America and in the world is law enforcement. The enemy of humanity is capitalism, but capitalism has people that protect it, and that's law enforcement. Whether it's the Oakland Police Department, whether the federal government, whether the CIA, FBI, or the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. Right, we have to be very, very clear about who our enemy is. So this is a problem we have here in this room in many places that among us, we look at the contemporary slave master as, you know, all right, right? Or oh, we have good cops and bad cops. No. Were there good slave masters and bad slave masters? We have to be very clear who our enemy is, right? Because some of us have friends that are law enforcement agents, right? How could we be friends with someone who's paid to kill you. Fundamentally, historically. And I don't want to get here and be in a soapbox, but I want to bring a point home. A correctional officer is no different. He carries a badge, he carries a gun when he leaves that unit. And he could be nice, he could provide you with ODR, with a food, a meal, with a newspaper, with cigarettes. But at the end of the day, they are programmed to kill you if you defy conventionalism. So there are no rogue officers or departments. The whole system has been designed to keep us oppressed, to keep us fighting each other, to keep us looking at our differences, at our skin tone, at our lips, right? And that's a problem we have, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a non-violent offender. Uh, well, I'm a violent offender. What is, well, I'm innocent. Well, well, I'm guilty. What does it really matter? The point is you're being incarcerated, you're being held in captivity. And we're still being excluded from the former economy. So some of us may be privileged to have jobs, but if we have over 70 million people of us who have an arresting conviction history, who have the rap sheet, there's a problem there because not all of us have jobs. And so you could have, many of us who have the privilege of having jobs and be grateful, but we can no longer be apologetic for who we are. So we're getting to places that, and this is what, as a formerly incarcerated, critically conscious person that, that, that perturbs me, disturbs me, however you want to frame it, that gets under my skin, is when we apologize for being the people that we've been conditioned to be. Again, we've been conditioned to, to, to hate ourselves. Those of us that was using dope, holding guns, we've been conditioned to do the things that the state has imposed upon us. I'm a G.I. Joe baby. 
I'm a he-man baby. Those were the things that told me, this is how you got to be a man. You got to have muscles. You got to be able to know how to use a gun. But that's a problem, right? When amongst each other, we don't recognize who our friends are and who's our enemy. So if law enforcement is in this room, law enforcement is uncomfortable because we know who you are. Right? You're uncomfortable in this room if you're here at the moment because we know who you are. Right? Because those of us that have been tempered a certain way know when we're dealing with certain people. And one of the biggest problems we had is that we don't combat liberalism enough in our circles. We'll say, you know, I got a friend that's in law enforcement. I got a colleague. Now, there's a difference when we're trying to pass certain things. We're using tactical reasons. You might need a law enforcement to come and speak on your bill. But get it clear, he is not your friend. Make that clear distinction. He is not, or she is not, or they is not your friend. And that's what all of us and none is. That we look at what's the truth, historically, and we find ways to make it simple so that a common day formerly incarcerated person or family member can understand what the root cause of our problem is. And I think Daryl and other people have used the analogy, I know Kenny has, that if you have a boil on your arm and you put some type of cream on it or antibiotic and then you have another boil that comes out in your knee the following day and you continue to put ointment, wouldn't you want to know what's causing that problem? What's the root cause of that problem? As opposed to just putting a band-aid fixed to it? Right, and not many of us have been exposed to the Franz Fanon. Not many, how many here heard of Franz Fanon? How many here have not heard of Franz Fanon? Y'all should read that book. The rest, uh, the rest of the earth is, for example, right? It gets into how we've been colonized. We've been conditioned to hate ourselves, right? George Jackson, Blood in My Eye. Right, these are books that shape many of us in this room to have a critical consciousness. Now, I've said this before, and, and yesterday we had a panel on political prisoners. We do a disservice when we don't pick up the mantle of those that sacrificed before we did and are serving time in our cages for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We got political prisoners that have been down almost 50 years because they're considered the undeserving. They've been rendered invisible by the United States government. And we had... We say black lives matter, yet we say brown lives matter. I mean, you, the, the problem is when I say I, all lives matter, which is true, it don't practically matter, right? And we need to impose that in our communities and hold our pastors accountable. We need to be able to hold all these people that say they represent us and they supplant our voices and leadership accountable. There's a lot of people who are making money off our misery and they sometimes look like us right they sometimes look like us and so we have to be very careful that as we move forward we know who we're building with and if you're formally incarcerated and if you're a family member of someone inside we need to be able to recognize and honor each other's leadership right and so here's some practical so things we need to first embrace duality. Embrace that person in the community who don't speak the same language that some of us speak here. Because there's many PFK, PFK booms in our communities that don't get the same recognition. I mean, you got Jack Bryson standing over there who won't get the same recognition because he ain't got probably alphabet before or after his name, but he's in the community. And we need to embrace people that may not necessarily be politically correct in everything they do, but are in touch with their community. We need to embrace folks that won't have the same platforms we do, but are building in their community. So you have to go back to your community and figure out how many neighbors do I know in my block, in my street? How do I know that if an incident happens, I can knock on the door and they'll let me in because I've built that relationship with them. That's something tangible that you can go back home and do. Instead of building bars in your house and, and adding them more expenses, how do you build neighbors? How do you build a sense of community, right? And one last thing before I said that you, you raised, uh, compañera, is that you mentioned Operation Streamline, right? Uh, uh, for those who are not familiar, Operation Streamline was that a, a thousand folks or something like that you mentioned are being seen right away and getting sp uh, a speedy trial or speedy. The same thing happened in the courts in Israel, the military courts, 
with young folks, and I personally witnessed, and Laura Whitehorn and a few other people that are in the room, we witnessed what happens when young kids are being processed and they already have a verdict before they even show to court. And that's the kind of system we're up against. So we gotta go back and figure out how do we build our neighbors? How do we build a campaign that's, around, that's evolving around our leadership, around our issues, around our needs to develop neighbors instead of the labels they give us? Because we're not ex-felons, we're not ex-offenders, we're not inmates. We're formerly incarcerated people, and people is the operative word. Thank you.